Hi, uh, this is Possibilities. My name is Cecil Walker. And I'm Adam Froer. And uh, right now we're going to have a chat about confidence um, and, and the differences I think that can make for uh, clinicians, but also for the people who are coming in trying to, to find some confidence in therapy themselves. Um, I guess the best place to start is, is what are we referring to when we talk about confidence? What is confidence? What are people looking for when they try to get confidence? Yeah, that's a good question because I think one of the reasons that it came up that we wanted to talk about this is because oftentimes people ask us, like, how do I get good at this particular skill or task? Um, how do I build my confidence? And so one of the things that we started talking about as we were in kind of in preparation for this is um, confidence really has a really tight connection to the to the idea of trust, right? right? Either um, I'm putting my trust in someone or something else, right? I'm confident in them or I'm placing confidence in mm -hmm. them. Um, but I think really what we're trying to get at is um, in some sense putting trust in myself. How can I how can I trust that I'm capable of this thing? Mm -hmm. How can I how can I feel sure mm -hmm. um, in the trust that I'm putting in myself? Just to distill that down a little bit, because I think uh, you have uh, some brilliant ideas on this. When someone comes to us and says, I want to be confident in this thing, I want to do it like I know what I'm doing, uh, where would you tell them to place their trust? What's the, the trust formula, I guess, for, <laughs> for, uh, for doing that? Yeah, so I'm not sure that there is a trust formula, but I think that there are some things that can help. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things I go back to, and this maybe is going to be a bit of a nerdy answer, but um, when we talk about things that are evidence-based, right, um, and that's, that's becoming kind of all the rage, that we want to do something that's based on evidence. We want to, in other arenas, you hear things like best practices. You want to do things that are in line with the best mm -hmm. practices. And I think one of the things that, the reason that I'm gonna go back to that is that when you look at the evidence-based literature, there are actually three components. And the first one is what we oftentimes get caught up on, which is empirical support. Mm -hmm. Like, does this work? Yes or no, how does it work, right? We know, we know the research says this. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people will put their trust in this process simply because research says that it works. Right. And so I think that's one way that we can build confidence is that we can gain knowledge, we can gain understanding, we can, we can understand what those best practices are. But I think if that's the only thing that we put our trust and confidence in, we're gonna fall short when it comes to interacting with mm -hmm. clients. The second component in evidence-based practice besides empirical support is actually clinical expertise. And so in some sense, that's related to what we're talking about here, because it's really like, how do I put trust in me? How mm -hmm. do I know that I'm an expert mm -hmm. of this process? And so I think that's one thing, and I'll probably come back at you with a question in a minute, but that's a second place that we have to put trust, that yeah. I know what I'm doing, that I know how to do this work well. And then the third thing, interestingly, when you look at evidence-based practice, is that you then apply a particular treatment based on the client's values. So it's not that we just apply the same thing every time, right. that it's a blanket that if it works for you, it's gonna work for me. That's not what evidence-based practice actually is. It's that we match what you need with what you value. And so I think that's the other piece of confidence is that we put confidence in who we're working with that they actually can utilize what they need to utilize and they'll let go of what they need mm -hmm. to let go of. And, and I think that's why solution-focused therapy is such a uniquely positioned approach is because it really is based on that, whatever it is that you decide we need to do here, that's what mm -hmm. we'll do. I, I know you said you have a question or two, but uh, from what you just said, I have a question. Um, all of this, I think, is built on the assumption that uh, Confidence is good and does make a difference for the work that we're doing. What difference does it make? What does it different does it make to the client? What difference does it make to, to us as the clinician doing it? Yeah, that's a really important question because I think one of the things that, again, and a nerdy answer, is 
from research, we know the most effective clinicians are people who are seen as competent. Mm -hmm. They they come across as like able to convey, I know what I'm doing and I believe in what I'm doing. Again, mm -hmm. it kind of goes back to that idea of trust. I trust me and I trust my ability to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it does make a difference because when the client sees the clinician as mm -hmm. competent and as confident, they believe the clinician more. Yeah. But I think in addition to that, when the clinician can see the client as somebody who's capable of having trust or confidence put in them, mm -hmm. right? I think that makes a difference because that then gives me the opportunity to take a step back and to say, how do you want to use this information? How do you want to incorporate this into your life? Mm -hmm. um, it makes it so that I don't have to tell them what to do, but I get to just simply ask them questions and let them be determined however they want to be determined. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we know that people have these questions of confidence. We know that people uh, want to know how to do this well. We know clients come in wanting the confidence to do whatever they need to do, the conf use their conf confidence for. Um, so how then do we answer? Well, <laughs> you're sneaking in another question here. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right, I'll be fair. It's your turn for a question. Go ahead, ask the question, and then, I'll, and then I'll make sure that I get my question. I might be stealing your question. <laughs> I, I, I guess what I'm asking is, for the sake of people who might be watching this, um, you know, how do I become confident then? I, I gotta trust in the right places, I have to put, so what's the step that I take? What do I do to see myself moving towards uh, confidence? Yeah, I think I think there's lots of things that become important here, but I think I think I'm going to go way back before you even like walk into a therapy room, mm -hmm. right? I think you have to get to the core of who are you? Mm -hmm. What do you value? Um what do you find interesting? Um if you don't if you don't know you, you're going to have a very hard time walking in and conveying confidence. Mm -hmm. Um there's there's a real science to this, but there's also a real art mm -hmm. to it. No, no two clinicians are going to do a session exactly the same way. Um, I think we all kind of go through that that phase of like trying to mimic whoever we've watched, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and we say if I can do it like they do it, and then ultimately we discover I can never do it the way they do it, <laughs> and so then we kind of give ourselves permission to do it the way we do it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know the way you do it, if you don't know who you are, if you don't pay attention to why you find particular things interesting, it's going to be hard to get over the mm -hmm. mimicking stage um, because you'll always think, well, somebody's going to do it better than I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's one of the key things mm -hmm. that I would say is like, you have to, you have to know who you are. Mm -hmm. You have to know what you value. Yeah. I, I think that's a brilliant sentiment. I, I had a, um, jazz theory professor in undergrad uh, who was a genius. He's in like the Alabama Hall of Fame for jazz musicians or whatever it is. Um, and one of the things he used to say the most was the only difference between great performers, the only thing that determines, uh, you know, some difference between the, all these different people who are doing what they do so effectively is um, just how they get from where they are to where they're going. They're, they're doing the same thing. We're all making music mm. and we're all making music really well. The difference as we see is just how we get from one point to the other. And the ways that people uh, come to develop their way of getting from one place to another is like you were saying, they know themselves, they know what they like, they know what they've seen other people doing that speaks to them and why that speaks to them. They know what uh, makes sense and why it feels good to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good. I. One of, the, one of the questions that I have, um, we're talking all about like you have to know yourself mm -hmm. and you have to walk in there and you have to be sure and you have to, um, but in the past couple of episodes of Possibilities, we focused on things like uncertainty, mm -hmm. like the, there's value in mm -hmm. uncertainty and we've talked about like smallness, mm -hmm. right? And there's real value in seeing yourself as something small in the grand scheme of things. So how does confidence and this kind of need to be sure mm -hmm. fit in with those other concepts that we've said are also important? I, I think that's a really good question because I think it requires uh, 
a nuanced way of looking at things to be able to hold all those together. Mm. And I think it's helpful if we do. Um, I think this confidence thing, actually, you could see it as kind of like some twine that wraps all these other things together. Uh, because if you take the smallness that we were talking about before, and you really make meaning out of that in the ways that we were talking about it, it's not just that you see yourself as uh, small, and hopefully that doesn't lead to any kind of futile thinking too, that, that the mm -hmm. world is too big or things are too big or there's so much outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it should show you that there is a particular place for you and some need for intentional function to the things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, even if that's alongside lots of other people and things and bigness of other stuff outside of yourself. Um, and then in addition to that, the uncertainty uh, shouldn't just stop at um, there is uncertainty. So I, again, should feel like things are futile, futile and, and that I should uh, not <laughs> attempt to do things, not attempt to make progress on things. Um, it should be that an acceptance that you find yourself in relation to that uncertainty, just like mm. an acceptance of yourself in relation to um, the, the smallness of yourself um, in relation to the bigness of things outside of yourself. Um, and then confidence starts to show up when that acceptance sinks into the right place, when you find yourself um, with the right amount of humility, the right amount of understanding of your smallness in comparison to the existence of other people's perspectives and, mm -hmm. and the other things outside of yourself. Um, when you make sense of there is uncertainty in the world um, but then that motivates you to go and do things with purpose and, and to do what you can in the face of that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think confidence is, is kind of what starts to like uh, give a bit of structure to you know how you're acting, uh, given that these things exist, given that mm -hmm. these are elements out there. Yeah, I like that answer because in some sense you're saying like there will always be unknown, mm -hmm. but what... But what you can determine is what's important to you and how do you mm -hmm. act given that things mm -hmm. are unknown. And so the confidence is like an inner confidence. It's not like I can I can know or predict right. everything, but it's that I know I know what's important to me. I know what I value. I know. And therefore, when something comes my way that's uncertain, mm -hmm. then I then I can trust. I can again bring it back to that connection of trust. I can put my trust yeah. in the fact that I'll know how to deal with something that's uncertain. Yeah. Um, that because I know who I am, because I know where to, where, what are, what's important to me, I know what to value when yeah. things become uncertain. Yeah. I think that trust definition behind confidence uh, comes in really handy there in, mm -hmm. in answering that question. Yeah. So the, the other question that I have too, that I'm wondering is oftentimes when we get asked this question, it's usually paired with like, so how do you do this thing that I know how to do, but how do you do this thing when it's really hard, right? Or when mm -hmm. somebody walks in the room and they have something that's particularly difficult. And in, and what I hear in that is kind of connected to what we're talking about is like, whatever walks into my room, there's, it's, it's going to be uncertain every single time. Mm -hmm. Even if I've seen this person five times, mm -hmm. The sixth time they walk into the room, I don't know what's going on for them. I don't know what mm -hmm. they've encountered. So it's unknown every single time. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when we talk about like, how do you build confidence? Our answer is, well, you practice. Mm -hmm. But how do you practice something that is consistently changing, that's consistently mm -hmm. evolving? And even if it's not that client, it's a different client. Mm -hmm. And even if they come in and they say they have the exact same problem, it doesn't look like the same problem because mm -hmm. it's an entirely different person. Mm -hmm. So how do you practice something that's never the same twice? I, the word that fits the best here uh, to me is fluency. In your practicing, you should be practicing to gain fluency in all the things that you need fluency in for this. And I think that applies to any skill or activity that you're doing. You want fluency in that thing. Um, if we're talking literally about learning a language, if you're learning Spanish, and you've never known Spanish before, um, you can't just memorize, here's a sentence that I can use, because all the other sentences that people are throwing at you, that sentence might not follow after. <laughs> it might not make sense in all the different contexts you're in. Um, it might not be that useful to you. But if you're fluent in Spanish, it doesn't matter where you move to, it doesn't matter what someone's saying to you. 
um, some level of fluency allows you to still be able to navigate that conversation. Um, and so in your learning that new language and you're building fluency, the fluency is, is um, it takes into account the flexibility that's <laughs> necessary and isn't just a uh, here's how to, um, you know, a very fixed technical understanding of how to do that thing. So what I, what I really love about that is you brought back to my mind a memory of you interacting with mm -hmm. my youngest daughter, right? And you're a beautiful musician. So you came over to our house and you sat down at our piano and you played, you just improvised <laughs> a piece, right? And she was, she's learning the piano, right? Mm -hmm. So she's learning the fundamentals and it sounds very like purposeful, right? <laughs> And you sat down and just fluidly played this thing. And she noticed that you had no music. And then she, afterwards, she asked you, she said, how did you play that? <laughs> you didn't have any music. And you said to her, the same way you talk. And she was a bit confused by your <laughs> response. But in essence, what you were trying to say was exactly what you just said. You have, you have a bank of knowledge mm -hmm. of words and you haven't memorized say this sentence or say that sentence because you have a mastery of words mm -hmm. you can put words together in any exactly. configuration and that's the way then you make sense and you feel you don't have to think you're confident in your ability yeah. to speak right you just say things and in some sense you don't even think about what you're going to say because you have that fluency yeah. and you were saying in some sense i've practiced enough i know the skill of music enough mm -hmm. i know the fundamentals of music mm -hmm. That when I sit down, I don't think about like, what am I going to play? Right. I just let the playing come because it's coming from this bank of knowledge. And therefore I can be flexible. I can deal with the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a really beautiful example. That Yeah, no, I think music illustrates that really, really well. Um, I've taught music to lots of students for uh, six or seven years now. Um, and the thing, so a lot of people enter into that space of wanting to learn piano uh, by just saying, I want to be able to play this piece. Um, and that's totally fine. I mean, some people, that's all they can fit in into their lives or into, you know, whatever their hobby space is. Um, but I think if you really want to become a good musician, if you really want to learn the instrument or music itself, um, you, you should care less about playing that one particular piece and care more about actually learning, uh, I guess the word we're using is fluency in music. Um, I really genuinely think anyone can memorize how to press the right keys in the right order. You don't have to know how to read music. You don't have to have like a musical bone in your body. If I just say, press that at this point, anybody can do that. <laughs> um, but the hard part of becoming a good musician, I think, is building up, like you said, this bank of knowledge, this reservoir of words and phrases that you can put together and understanding of um, all the many nuances to how music works and how good music is put together. Mm, yeah, and I think kind of bringing it back to this whole idea of confidence, mm -hmm. right? It's um, confidence grows over time, Absolutely. right? I think um, I look at, again, I look at my daughter and she, she can feel confident in playing a piece, mm -hmm. right? And you can watch as she first starts playing it to when she, it's time to perform that, that she feels sure that she can do it. And she's, she's confident in a narrow slice of things. And I think over time, that confidence builds because now I know I can play mm -hmm. multiple things or mm -hmm. I know that I know music theory well enough that I can play these keys really well. Yeah. Or, and I think, I think that we can feel good about um, wherever we are in that process, that we don't we don't have to wait until we can play anything mm -hmm. in order to feel confident. Mm -hmm. We can trust that we can we can be confident at this level mm -hmm. and know that we'll still get better, and we mm -hmm. can be confident, more confident in other things at other times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, not to over harp on these music analogies that we're we're making, but I think it fits really really well. I, I used to have um, one music professor, actually he was the director of the uh, choral ensemble that we were in, and it was a pretty small group of, of undergraduate students. Um, so he didn't mind monologuing at us <laughs> at length. Um, uh, but he would say in our rehearsals, especially when we were starting a new piece, you get frustrated because we were singing it timidly. We were trying to avoid mistakes. We were trying to, um, you know, we wanted to do a good job, but we were also 
doing it in a way that was extremely, you know, lacking confidence. <laughs> um, and he would get frustrated, not because we were making mistakes, but because we were doing it in a way that was lacking confidence. Um, and he said that he wanted us to always feel like we could try our best to make good music like right now. Um, even if mistakes are going to come up, even if there's things that are unfamiliar to you, um, we would sing songs in Latin and French and all these other languages um, that, you know, most of us for the most part did not speak. Um, but he would still say like, what you should be doing is trying to do it as the highest level that you can possibly do it and not cutting any of that down mm -hmm. for the sake of uh, worry about, you know, not doing it well or, or making some mistake or being unfamiliar with something. So maybe one final question. Yeah. Um, and it's a potentially a big question, but potentially a mundane question. What, what difference does confidence actually make? Like, why is it important that you have it? <laughs> um, I, maybe that's a mundane question, or maybe that's a huge question too. <laughs> Um, I, I think confidence, it, it frees up room in, in the, the space for you uh, in anything that you're doing. I, we're talking a lot about therapy and I guess we've talked about music too, but I think it takes all that stuff out of the room that's getting in your way, if that's fear or if that's doubt, because um, that stuff like constricts you, I think. It mm -hmm. stops you from, um, maybe you won't ask that question that you normally would ask, or you won't put in the extra detail that that question needed uh, because of some lack of confidence. You weren't sure that you could place those words there or do it in the way that you were maybe thinking you wanted to do it. Um, I, I feel like it just removes options from you. It kind of takes away uh, flexibility, it takes away creativity, mm -hmm. um, all the things that could make what you're doing actually be really, really good second guessing and doubting yourself subtracts that yeah and the thing that you made me think of too is that so much of this work is about a connection mm -hmm. right like really understanding the mm -hmm. person that you're talking to and feeling like you're understanding them and that they're understanding you and i would even go as far to say like you're putting trust in them and they're putting trust in you yeah. and there there's a bond that comes about and i think oftentimes when people don't feel confident mm -hmm it becomes like the the wheel in your head that's just like constantly spinning right it's you you almost have like double mind mm -hmm. where you're trying to listen to what they're saying but simultaneously you're like so what do i do and how do i say this and what's the right right sorry right question mm -hmm. and the, and so the connection gets ruptured yeah because you're not actually attending you're trying to think how do i do this just right so I think lack of confidence, like you, the word, I, the phrase you use, which I really like, is that it frees it up, mm -hmm. right? I no longer have to have that wheel spinning mm -hmm. because now I can just trust in this connection and I can say, whatever they say, I'm just gonna listen to wholeheartedly. Yeah. And then if I need to, I'll take a minute and I'll think about the question and then I'll ask the question. But I, but I believe in my ability to to come up with the right question, a right question, and therefore I can then invest mm -hmm. in what's going on here. And I think that, I think that makes all the difference. I think um, then, then I'm paying attention to what yeah. I should be paying attention to instead of all the things that could get in the way of that. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a brilliant point. There is a finite amount of space for what you're doing and any worry that you're doing, I think, subtracts from the connection that you could be making, mm -hmm. the listening that you could be doing. Um, and so when you get that out of the way, when you feel like you have the confidence you need, uh, the connection is that much stronger. You are now more capable of actually really fully investing in this. Uh, Putting the trust. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. It's very good. Well, I, I think that's all we got for uh, confidence. Um, hopefully that was really, really helpful. Um, I feel like it was enlightening to me. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that's all for today. This was Possibilities, and uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Yeah, and if you liked what you saw, make sure that you like and subscribe um, to this YouTube channel. Make sure you share it with your friends as well. Um, if you heard something that you think other people might benefit from.